Here's a picture of some pre-touring computers. They're wearing dresses, some of them. They're people. <laughs> to be a computer, that was a job description. There were a lot of people, thousands of people, who worked as computers. And, in the old days, computers had to understand the rules. Most of them were math majors, people like that. Unemployed mathematicians or math teachers. Or people. They had to appreciate the reasons for what they are doing. And Turing recognized that this was not necessary. That was his strange conversion. So let's compare them. There's Darwin. By the way, the caps are in the original in Mackenzie's. It was an high outrage. So there it is in caps. But now let's look at Turing. In order to be a perfect and beautiful computing machine, it is not requisite to know what it is. The two of them together are basically the same strange inversion. They are both pointing out, I think for the first time in human history, that there is such a thing as competence without comprehension. That was what was so offensive to Mackenzie. And after all, our whole educational system seems to be geared to the idea that the reason we want our students to comprehend is that competence flows from comprehension. And in most regards, of course, that's, that's good as that. You want them, don't just teach them by rote get them to understand it, then they'll have the comprehension from which the competence will flow naturally. And what both Darwin and Turing do is they simply throw that out. That is a strange conversion. They say, no, no, we can have competence, staggering competence, without comprehension at all. How does it go? And of course, the upshot of this is that understanding, intentionality, mind, consciousness, is an effect, not a cause. It is not the source of all the competence, it is a product of all that competence. Now, uh, Don mentioned uh, 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 my uh, attempt to contribute to cognitive ethology uh, yesterday. And one of the things that is very noticeable, if you look at the people looking at animals, scientists and lay people alike, is that they attribute much more understanding to the agent than need be. They, they think of the animal as sort of understanding, like those computers in the dresses, understanding the routines that they engage in. And there's a reason for this, and the reason is that we do not have, in the manifest English, in the ordinary language, a familiar concept of semi-understood quasi-representations. To say nothing of any semi-demi-understood <laughs> pseudo <-words. laughs> But this is what Turing provides in space. Lots, whole, our, whole uh, panoplies of concepts of semi-understood quasi-pseudo any deni representations. And that is how computer science has provided us with uh, the tremendous boost that it has. Recently, I've been talking about this as the sort of operator. The CPU sort of understands add and subtract. In what sense? Well, when the add, when the add uh, instruction gets into the instruction register, the thing adds. And when the subtract instruction gets there, it's, it, it, it subtracts. And so forth. The operating system sort of understands where to file away the result from the accumulator. The search engine sort of knows not to bring back occurrences of cat when you ask for catamaran. The airline reservation system sort of understands when you say you want to fly to Chicago. The deep blue sort of understands the changing value of the night as the chess game progresses and so forth. So what we get here is a sort of gradualism in Turing, which echoes the gradualism of Darwin, where we go from the simplest possible cells up through multicellular life to fancy and fancy and more complex things. We get competence without comprehension, and then we use that to build competence with uh, pseudo comprehension, and uh, then competence with quasi comprehension. Then we finally get up to where we're willing to call, call it competence with comprehension. In fact, what we do is that we construct comprehension out of competences. A bag of tricks, a whole lot of penny semi demi comprehending sub agents, put them all together and you get comprehension. Now, some people flat deny that the last step is genuine comprehension. They say, no matter how far you go, how much you pile on 
the competences, you never get the comprehension. John Searle is the obvious uh, exemplar of that. He simply draws a line and says, no, 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 you never can get to real semanticity, to real comprehension, uh, no matter how hard you try, no matter how long you carry this on. It's a nice way of showing what is sort of profoundly, I think, unscientific uh, in, in John Searle's position. He's a sort of vitalist about comprehension. Hmm. We understand how life can be constructed out of non-living parts. And we have to understand how comprehension is constructed out of non-comprehending parts. Same sort of deal. Now, for this sort of reason, I think that the manifest image and the scientific image need non-stringency because they need to sort of operate. And the sort of operator gives you things which I want to call real, or at least real enough. Back to Don and dollars. Real? We'll find out. <laughs> now, I end real patterns by saying that I find my position clearer than either of the labels instrumentalism or realism. And the thing is that I still do. I've tried to say why. Uh, so set me straight, please. Thank you.